So we're going to go ahead and go to John chapter 2. We started last week. Um, we're going to go going through the book of John. We did all of chapter 1 last week. Chapter 2 is a lot shorter. It'll be a little easier to get through this. But some really, uh, really good things I want to cover in here tonight. Well, let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1. And it says, And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now, this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Canaan of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and the disciples believed on him. So right here we have the story of what uh, is called the first miracle of Jesus. All right, now you know it's always we always want to be careful assuming things. All right, I think it's okay to assume things and speculate as long as it doesn't contradict the Bible. But I like to call this Jesus' first recorded miracle. Okay, and there's a very good reason why I think that this probably wasn't his first miracle. Okay, now. So I'm assuming this is the first miracle that the Bible records, but notice in this story, it mentions how there, you know, Jesus has been called to this wedding. His disciples were called and it mentions his mother, Mary was there at this, at this marriage. And here they have this problem. There's no wine. Okay. Now, how, and what does she do? She goes to Jesus. There's no wine. Now, why would she do that? Why is that Jesus problem? Is it Jesus responsibility to, you know, to, you know, provide uh, you know, wine for the people at this marriage. But, you know, that's not his problem. Nobody expected this from him. But Mary somehow knew that Jesus could solve this problem. And that tells me it was either because she had seen him do miracles before or she had a lot of faith. I mean, think, think about that. If Jesus had never done a miracle before and yet she knew he could do this, that's a lot of faith, but I think it's very possible. There were probably some, she probably saw some interesting things in those 30 years raising Jesus Christ, raising the Messiah. I just, I have to believe there were some things that happened. I know I never saw it, but I know they made a movie. I think it's called the young Messiah or something. It's about Jesus when he was a kid. And uh, I, I, I saw in the preview, they had him doing some miracles on there. And obviously that's all speculation, but I don't know. I, I think he probably did. I just, it, it's hard to imagine him walking the earth those 30 years and nothing really cool happening during that time. I'm sure it did. But um, she says in verse 3, look at, look at, I like how it says it. You know, when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And look what she says here. His mother saith unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. All right? I love this too because of the fact that she doesn't know how he's going to do it, but she just knows, hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. Whatever Jesus says to do, just do it. This is, this is a man that can take care of anything. That Jesus Christ, he can, he can do anything. He can provide, heal, whatever he wants to do, he can do it. And think about that. What is our responsibility to do as believers? What does God want us to do? Whatever he says to do. I mean, whatever we, we are commanded to do, we ought to do it. Whatever he says, we ought to do it. Whenever it comes to, you know, challenges that come up in our lives. Okay? How many times have we been in a situation where we had no idea what the Lord was going to do or how the Lord was going to get us out of this situation? But when that happens, what are we supposed to do? We're just supposed to do whatever he says to do. And you're going to find yourself many times in life in situations where it's like, there's nothing that can be done. 
There's nothing, you know, there, there's no way I can get out of the situation. I have no idea what the Lord's going to do, but we don't need to worry about what he's going to do. We just need to worry about what we're supposed to do. And our responsibility is just to be obedient. And Mary, she preached a great sermon to those guys. She just basically said, Hey, whatever he tells you to do, do it. She had no idea how he was going to do it. She didn't know that he was going to, you know, she didn't tell him, Hey, go get the pots of, you know, go get those pots, fill them with water. So he can turn, she didn't do any of that. She just said, whatever he tells you to do, do it. I love that. I, I, and right there, even if she had seen him do miracles before, it shows, it shows great faith. She didn't have any idea how he's going to do it, but she knew he was the one that could take care of this. And so, uh, you know, she told the service, do whatever he says. And, you know, this is my opinion too. I, you know, notice how when she immediately goes to Jesus about this, how Jesus says to her, you know, mine hour is not, you know, woman, what do I do? Mine hour is not yet come. Okay. It wasn't time for Jesus to start revealing himself to Israel, but it, uh, and doing this miracle is going to get a lot of attention, isn't it? But at the same time, Mary, it's like, she's anxious for him to do it. She, she wants to, this is the way I look at it. Doesn't every parent, when your kid is able to do something that's impressive, want to show it off? Okay. How many have ever been bored to tears before when some, you know, friend of yours, some parents like, Hey, come watch my little Johnny or Susie do whatever. All right. And then they do, they do their little thing. They say their ABCs or they count to 10 or something. And you know, it's not your kid. You don't care. Okay. But then, you know, you got the mommy right there and she's just, you know, I mean, you see how smart they are. I mean, isn't that impressive? There's this lady I know, she's always talking about her granddaughter and she's always talking about her, how smart her granddaughter is. And knowing this lady and knowing her kids that had, I just, I had my doubts about how smart this kid was. She was always talking about how smart the kid was. And I saw them the other day at Walmart and it was so funny, the little kid, it's not that smart. And it, it, it was funny because we're standing there and it's she's about the same age as Lana. And it was so funny. We saw him and said, hi. And that the little girl, she just kind of come walking up to Lana and just gave her a big hug. And, you know, she's just kind of like, you know, what's going on? But it, one of the reasons I know she's not that smart, I saw him again the other day. And her sister, her older sister, was out walking her on a leash. <laughs> she, had, she had her on a leash. It wasn't around her neck. It's all right. It wasn't around her neck. But it was like, you know, kind of around her chest and stuff. But, yeah, they have to have this girl on a leash because she's obviously out of control. You know, there's probably no discipline stuff in that house, but I, I was, we were looking at that and laughing. I wonder what they call that. Cause you know, they don't call it a leash, but it was a leash. They have to take this kid out on a leash. All right. That, and so, but you know, and at the same time, like, yeah, I was telling my wife, her grandma thinks she's just the smartest <laughs> kid in all the world, but we're looking at it's like, they have to put it on a leash. But anyway, what parent doesn't want to show off their kid. And so imagine if your child is Jesus Christ, what if your child is the son of God? Okay. I mean, you have to know, you know, we don't always know, you know, see Mary around in a lot of the stories, but you know, she probably, you know, we know she was around for this miracle. Maybe she was around for others and you had to know she was proud during those times. I mean, what must have been like to be the mother of Jesus Christ? And so she, she's just doing right here. I think she's just doing what any proud mother does. Here's a need. She knows my son can take care of this. And what does she do? She immediately goes to him. But yet I believe when Jesus did this, okay. He, uh, I don't believe that everyone in the story knows it's him. I think the servants knew. it mentions the servants knew, but before we get to that, I want to show you, I, I just want to cover this with you. I don't believe that Jesus in this story made alcoholic wine. All right. I've got to cover that in this story. People love to use an excuse for drinking alcoholic wine. Uh, you know, they use Jesus that he turned water into wine as an excuse. I saw a picture one time uh, that somebody they posted online of Walmart. It had a wine section, but in that wine section, the sign there said water. And then it had a caption on there that says Jesus was here or something. But, uh, you know, Jesus that, that didn't make alcoholic wine. Well, how do you know that? Well, it says in verse 9, when the rule of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he knew not whence it was, but the servants who drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning 
doth set forth good wine. And when the men have well drunk, then that, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. Okay? They give the good stuff out first. All right? Well, some would say, well, that's the old stuff. You know? But at the same time, when did Jesus ever make anything and not make it new and make it good? Okay? When Jesus would heal people, I mean, when he, like when he would cleanse lepers, their skin was like a baby skin. It was pure. It was, it was always new. If Jesus made water into alcoholic wine, what Jesus made would have been rotten. And that's just not how he does things. And so, and it says, it, you know, it's good. You know, do the fresh stuff, the good stuff first. And after all that, if people are still wanting some, we'll go to the uh, older stuff after that. And so, and then also another reason in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 65, verse eight, okay, wine Today, when we talk about wine, we're talking about alcoholic wine. But in the Bible times, juice, okay? You don't see the word juice in the Bible, but juice, or wine is another word for juice. And in Isaiah 65, 8, it says, Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster. Y'all see that? Now, what do we call that inside the cluster, you know, inside the grapes? We call that the juice. We call it grape juice. But here in the Bible, it specifically says new wine in the clusters, Okay? So it's called that even in the cluster. It's not going to be fermented and old then. Okay. And, and then, uh, so right there, I think is more proof that it doesn't have to be alcoholic wine. But also, Jesus would not have made alcoholic wine because that would have just put people in a tempting situation. Because what does it say in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1? Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. And whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, okay? I mean, it, it wine, alcoholic wine, obviously, it is. It's a mocker. It makes you look bad when you drink it, okay? It deceives you. It tricks you. People think this makes me feel good. All right, I'm going to have a good time with this. But people all the time, when they are drunk, what do they do? They do foolish things. And it is. When you drink, your sense of reasoning is greatly impaired. You are more likely to sin. The Bible talks about a curse on him that giveth his neighbor wine or strong drink that he may uncover his nakedness. Many times people will get others drunk so they can get them to do things that they would not do sober. Why would Jesus be okay with somebody drinking something that impairs their thinking and their reasoning? Okay, it's like they have these you know, the stupid don't drink and drive, you know, programs are always trying to promote. Okay. And it's like, what's so ridiculous about that is, you know, when people are sober, you can teach them that. But here's the thing. If they start drinking, their reasoning is impaired. They're going to forget about that. Okay. So uh, I like just don't drink. Right? You know, there's no reason for it. There's no benefits to it. There is, there is no good purpose. It's not healthy. Even drinking in moderation, it's not healthy. Well, let's say, oh, you know, a little bit of wine is good for your stomach. Well, grape juice will do the same thing. So just, you know, uh, you know don't, don't go there. Proverbs 23, verse 29 says, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babbling, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes? They that tarry long at the wine, they that go to seek mixed wine, Look not thou upon the wine, when it is red, when it giveth its color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. At the last it biteth like a serpent, and stingeth like an adder. Thine eyes shall behold strange women, and thine heart shall utter perverse things. Yea, thou shalt be as he that lieth down in the midst of the sea, or as he that lieth upon the top of a mast. They have stricken me, shalt thou say, and I was not sick. They have beat me, and I felt it. When shall I awake? I will seek it yet again. Hey, Well, it's okay. As long as it's in moderation and you don't get drunk. Well, here's the thing. I don't know how much it take, how much wine it takes to get drunk, but if the people had already drunk all the wine and it was fermented wine, then, okay, maybe they weren't drunk yet, but isn't making it more, making more of it going to make them more likely to get drunk? You would think if it was alcoholic wine, if it's okay to do it in moderation, after they drank it all, Jesus would have said, you've had enough. Y'all are good. No, but no, he made more and they went and drank it. 
And it was better than stuff they made. Why? Because it was fresher. I mean, it was as probably as fresh as fresh could get. Why? Because it was made by Jesus Christ. It was made by the Creator. And so I think that is a terrible argument and a terrible excuse for drinking wine. Well, Jesus turned water into wine. Okay? He turned it into, in our modern vernacular, grape juice. All right? And they, they didn't use that term back then. And throughout the Bible, you'll see wine is used both. Sometimes it talks about new wine. Sometimes it doesn't specify, but it doesn't take a lot of study in every section of wine to figure out which it's talking about. And there are so many warnings and there are so many warnings about wine and about the dangers of it. Okay. There, even if, even if you could make an argument that you're not committing a terrible sin by drinking it in moderation. Well, here's the thing. There's no command to drink it. Therefore, I say to stay away from it. Total abstinence. All right. And you, you will never become an alcoholic if you never take the first drink. It'll never happen. It's impossible. So uh, don't, don't ever come to me with that and use that as an excuse for drinking wine. I'm not going to buy that. All right. Y'all are just looking for justification to be a drunk. All right. So just, uh, I, I see right through that. But anyway, and none of you have done that to me yet, but just, just in case you're ever thinking about it. All right. So then, uh, but uh, the only people in the story that knew the miracle had taken place was the disciples, Mary, and the servants. Mentions the servants knew. And, you know, and notice how the governor of the feast, you know, he's like wondering, you know, where'd this come from? And they don't answer. They don't tell him that it was Jesus that did that because I personally believe that the purpose of this miracle, Jesus in the chapter four, he had just called his disciples to follow him. And I believe he did that. And it mentions that after he did that, the disciples believed, I believe that he did that for the disciples. It was a miracle he did for them. You know, just here's some evidence, I guess you could say, you know, here's some proof that I am who I say I am. And they did. They, the disciple, it mentions the disciples believed him in that story. And so now look at verse 12, what it says. It says, after this, he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house an house of merchandise. And the disciples remember that it was written, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. That is a quote from, uh, what is it? Psalm 69, verse 9. But then at verse 18, then answered Jesus and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scriptures and the words word which Jesus had said. So right here we have the story of Jesus, his, his visit to the temple, that famous story where he's going, he's you know, pouring out the money, he's overthrowing tables, he made a scourge of small cords. I love that picture. Thinking about Jesus driving people out of the temple with a whip. I think I mentioned that Sunday night. I talked about that a little bit. But notice some things interesting about the story. Notice how Jesus went into that temple kind of like he owned the place. Think about that for a second. Because what would happen if I went in to another church or an, uh, somebody else's house? Okay, somebody else. You know, I have every right to go home tonight and say, you know what? I'm sick of this stuff and, and start throwing things away in my house. Okay. It's my house. But could I come in your house and do that? Do I have any right to come in your house and start going through your DVDs and start throwing the ones away I think are inappropriate and just, you know, going through your refrigerator and seeing if you have any wine in there and, you know, and, and throwing it out and just, do I have a right to do that in your house? And Jesus does that in the temple. He just walks in there kind of like he owns the place, starts driving people out and just starts cleaning a house. They're doing all these things in there they were not supposed to do. Now, you and I, we know why he did that because he did own the place. 
That was his house. He had every right to do that. But understand what these other people are thinking. Some of these people, they probably had been doing this for years. It was, you know, just a common thing. It, it had happened. It had been going on for so long. People probably thought nothing of it anymore. You know, the first time somebody came in there and started selling things, there were probably people that kind of had a problem with it. But you know what? They shut them up. They kept them quiet. And before you knew it, there's all these things being sold in there. And finally, the place is now a house of merchandise. It's a den of thieves. They're wheeling and dealing in there. And the house of God, it was very clear in the Bible uh, if you go back in the Old Testament, when it came to certain sacrifices and there were certain things they were supposed to get, you know, there are certain you know, doves and uh, sheep and all these things. And many times people would come from far countries to do these sacrifices. And so instead of bringing all these animals and possessions, they would go there and they would buy these things. But they weren't supposed to do it in the house of God. And they were, they, they were supposed to be very honest in how they did it. But you know what? It had turned into just like every you know businesses all over. Okay, we've all been raked over the coals before, haven't we? You know, we've all been taken advantage of by businesses. All right, you know, I, I could get up right now and I could tell some stories about some businesses and towns. You know, I'm, I'm going to do. I, I'm, I'm not going to use a pulpit to do that. All right, but I, I have. I've got. I've gotten ripped off before. I got ripped, ripped off bad by a business in here in town one time. Made me mad. I called them up. I gave them a piece of my mind. They didn't give me one dollar back, but you know what? It felt good letting them know just how crooked they were. Yeah, di didn't give me one dollar back. And when I am not behind the pool, but I will gladly tell you what that business is. All right. So, <laughs> but I won't do it right now. But anyway, you know, when you start bringing that stuff into the house of God, we've got a problem. And you know, one thing that you could say it's innocent, but you know, I, I, one thing I think we need to be careful of and just not do it around here to be safe is selling things in church. You know, a, a lot of times you'll have people that come through that maybe want to sell their, you know, their music CDs and things like that. You know, and we've, we've done some of that before, but you know what? Where does it cross the line? You ever thought about that? Where, where does it cross the line? You know, why don't we just not do it? You know, and, and some of these places too, I've seen people in churches that are crooks that sell things. We had a guy one time in my dad's church that came through and he had this big book table and he was selling these Bibles and we got these Bibles and I, I, you know, I got it. I, you know, I read through the Bible every year and I remember I was just, I was just a teenager. And I started reading through that Bible. I was finding spelling mistakes in that Bible. It had spelling mistakes in it. It had a whole page they had to add in a page because, you know, the printer accidentally left this big chunk of the Bible out. But I, I can't remember how many mistakes I found reading that Bible. You know, it, it was just a piece of junk. And there was a lot of, it, the, the guy was just crooked. And you know what? Years later, we found out this guy was operating a business over in the Philippines where people, churches were donating materials to you know, basically, you know, they, they thought they were giving it to him so he could give these things to poor churches over in the Philippines. And they turned out he had a warehouse over there and he was selling all these things to people, which not only was wrong and immoral, it was illegal to do in the Philippines. And the government over there found out about it. And but unfortunately, it was when he wasn't there and he never went back to the country because there's a warrant out for his arrest over there. A crook. I mean, the guy, the guy was just a crook. And, he, and a lot of these people, too, you know, they go to churches all over. and They're always selling things. You know, I'm not saying that's all bad, but you know what? There's just a problem when we come into church and you got somebody, you know, trying to get your money from you like that. You know, we do a free will offering here, but, you know, we're not we're not making deals with people. You know, and we're not cheating you. We're not selling you junk. And we really need to be careful with that stuff. And Jesus here, we see he had a huge problem with it. And he did. He, he went in there like he owned the place. He didn't show any mercy to those who you could maybe say drifted into sin. This was something that clearly wasn't supposed to be happening. But it, once again, it probably over time progressed into this crooked mess that we see here. And that's what happens many times in churches. Uh, you know, things creep in. The Bible warned about that, about false prophets. They're going to creep in 
and privily bring in damnable heresies. And you know, and we're seeing that today where, I mean, some horrible things are being taught in church. It's like, how can that be being taught in church? It, you know, it didn't happen overnight. It crept in. It slowly, it slowly happened. But Jesus, he didn't go walking in there and be like, yeah, I understand you all are deceived. I understand that, you know, y'all mean good. He didn't do that, did he? He went in there and he starts cleaning the house. He's driving these people out with a whip because they were in great sin. And so after he does this, the Jews, of course, are wondering, who are you to be doing this? You know, who are you to be coming in here, running us out? What gives you the authority to do this? And they asked a sign of him. They, they, you know, they're like, what sign? What, what verse is that? Uh, verse 18, then answered the Jews and said unto him, what sign showest thou unto us, seeing now that thou doest these things? Y'all see that? Now I've got to cover this too. Because this is just another thing that just, I, I, I'm sick of this. I'm sick of hearing people say this. They say it all the time and it just drives me nuts. Okay, there's lots of things I hear that are wrong and I'm patient. And I, but there's some things that they just, they trigger something in me. And it just irks me to no end. I'm tired of hearing, I, I'm, I'm just going to lose one of these days when I hear it. I am tired of hearing people say the Jews require a sign. I am so tired of hearing people say that. I mean, I told you all about the crazy doctrine I heard at that conference about the dead rising 40 days, the dead in Christ rising 40 days before the rapture. I, I told you all about that. I was telling people about that and how ridiculous that was. And there was no video proof of it. So I went online to see if I can find video proof of that. And I went and I, I found a sermon where he preached that same lunacy and I was reading the comments on it and some woman on there, she left a comment on there and she, she it said, I love Sam Gippen. What a study I'm about to get into on this one. The Jew requires a sign and what a sign it would be. She's, you know, cause he's saying when God raises them from the dead, that's going to be a sign. Hey, y'all better get ready. Jesus is about to come back. And she said, the Jews require a sign. What a sign that would be. You know why she said that? Because she hears these prophecy preachers all the time going around saying, you know, the Jews require a sign for thing. Another thing they say that for, they, you know, the, the pre-trib people, they teach that when we get raptured out, that's going to be a sign to the Jews and that's going to provoke them to jealousy. They're going to see how God raptures us and they get left behind and they are, they're going to see that and it's going to cause them to turn to Christ. And 144,000 of them are going to get saved and they're going to go evangelize the world. And they'll say, because the Jews require a sign. And notice right here in this story, what did they do when Jesus came in? And he quotes Bible to them. He quotes Old Testament to them. You know, and he says, you know, my house should be called a house of prayer. And then he tells them, but you've made it into a den of thieves. He was quoting a verse from the Old Testament. That should have been all they needed. They should have listened just to that. But what did they do? Let's see a sign. Show us a sign because the Jews require a sign. But notice what Jesus said. He said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Okay. And we all know what he was talking about there. They didn't know what he was talking about. But look at. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. 1 Corinthians 1, and verse 21, it says, For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign. There it is. And the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Okay? Did it say anything in there about the Jews require a sign, and so God's going to give them a sign? No, it says that's a stumbling block to the Jews. That's why most of them don't get saved, because I want a sign. Well, God's not going to give them a sign. God's not going to give, God will, is not going to give them a sign. The only sign that the Jews will ever get 
was already done when Jesus destroyed the temple, his body, and three days later he raised it from the dead. And they didn't believe that, and they will never believe any, they won't believe anything else. If they won't believe that, they won't believe anything else. Look at what it says in Luke chapter 16. Turn over to Luke chapter 16 in verse 27. Then said he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him, talking about Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. That's talking about the Old Testament. Uh, Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And guess what? That got proven 100% true when Jesus rose from the dead and they didn't believe him either, did they? They didn't believe it. One did rise from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead and they didn't believe him. So right here it says in Luke, they're not going to believe if one rose from the dead. The Jews, they kept asking for a sign because the Jews require a sign. Jesus said, you're not getting a sign except the sign of Jonas, he was three days and three nights in the belly. I'll be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Same sign as the destroy this temple in three days, I'll raise it up. The only sign God was going to give was his resurrection, and it didn't work. Why? Because we get saved when we believe on Christ by faith. If you have to see somebody rise from the dead, you're not having faith, are you? And I did. I heard it right from the mouth of Sam Gitt. He said... That I know what it says, you know, in Luke about, you know, they're not going to believe, they, you know, if, even if one rose from the dead. But don't you think some are going to believe? No. Absolutely. The Bible says they won't. And then you have these poor, pathetic people out there that listen to these prophecy preachers going around. The Jews require a sign. The Jews require a sign. And they hear that. Oh, man, that's, that's yep, that's what God's going to do because the Jews require a sign. They hear the pre-trib people. Yep, the rapture. You know, that, that's going to be the sign for the Jews. That way the Jews know because the Jews require a sign. Read your Bible, people. Just read, read the whole thing. Stop just focusing on one little line and one little verse. Read the whole context. I'm telling you, one of these days, I'm just going to spaz out. All right, I haven't got up and thrown a tomato in a church service yet. But I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I think next time, I won't throw a tomato. I, usually, I don't usually carry them, but... I'm going to throw a songbook or something, all right? Because, this, listen, this is ridiculous. We, we cannot let people get away with being this foolish with the Word of God and this careless with the Word of God, that people can be that irresponsible and absolutely moronic about simple scriptures and make up these crazy doctrines and say that fits because the Bible says the Jews require a sign. Listen, even if the Jews require a sign didn't, mean what these people say it means god never said he was going to do that raise people from the dead 40 days to give them you know give more and that's just it's absolutely nuts but that is what they do the jews do require a sign but god's not going to give it to them and that's why many of them don't get saved yes if we would you know if if you went and witnessed to most jews and if you asked them hey if I, i could show you jesus if i could do a miracle would you believe they would tell you yes. But, here, but here's the thing. God's not going to give you the ability to do that. Now, there is somebody that's going to come that's going to do so many signs and lying wonders. And guess who's going to buy into it? The Jews. Why? Because the Jews require a sign. And the Antichrist will give them signs and they will believe him. And but, you know, the Bible is so clear, folks. It, it's so right. But people, when you, when you have an agenda that you're trying to shove down people's throats, I mean, you are, you're just going to have to mangle the scriptures. And, it, and it's happening. And it does, man, it just, there's just some things that really get my goat. And that's one of the things that, that does. So anyway, but right there, though, Jesus, he did. He told them, destroy this temple. Three days, I'll raise it up. And we all know what that was talking about. He did that. When he, they destroyed the temple of his body, which, what, which is the real temple. And three days later, he rose from the dead. And so, 
Verse 23 says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Right here in these verses, there's another teaching that's out there that's absolutely false about this passage, where, once again, many times people have an agenda and they want to, you know, they, they twist the scriptures into meaning things that they don't believe. But you've, you've got the people out there that teach, like us, the way you get saved, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved. That's what we teach. We teach that it's not of works. You've got another group out there that teach repent and believe. Okay? I just watched a video of a guy that was witnessing to somebody. And, he, and this guy that he's witnessing to is completely lost, very confused in a lot of things. But then he was just like, you know, he, but he, this guy explained his philosophy. And he was familiar with Christianity and he didn't believe it. And, you know, and, and then he asked that guy, the, the soul winner, asked him, you know, what do you have to do to be saved? And he's like, well, you, you know, believe on Christ. And he said, no. And then he said, you have to repent and believe on Christ. Meaning, turn from your sin. This guy teaches that all the time. You know, you got you to stop sinning and believe in Christ. And what people do, they'll use this passage here to help prove that. Because notice it says there were many that believed in his name, but he, Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew it was in them. You know, they believed, but you know what? Jesus saw their hearts. They didn't really mean it. You know, they... It was clear they weren't going to turn from their sins. And when you pray and you believe in Christ, He knows if you really mean it. And if you're really going to turn from your sins. And if you don't, you know, if you don't, well, you might believe in Him, but does He believe in you? Uh, you know, you'll, you'll, hear, you'll hear some of those crazy things like that. But once again, it's just completely twisting what these mean. Okay, this is very this is actually very simple what it means when it says he did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men and needed not that any should testify man for he knew what was in man. This passage is showing us the knowledge of Jesus, how he knew the hearts of man. This I I call this chapter Jesus Christ the miracle worker. It, we have him turning the water into wine there. I mean, right here, it, you know, John really focuses on the deity of Christ. And Jesus, he had the amazing ability that we see throughout the Gospels that he could see what was in the hearts of man. He always knew what they were thinking. When the multitude would come to him for questions, he always knew what they were really getting at. He always knew if they were looking for answers or if they were just trying to trip him up. He knew it. And so every time he was able to stump them. Every time he was either able to answer their question or if they were putting him in a situation, ask him an impossible question, he would. He would just give this wise answer that would just shut them down that they couldn't handle. And right here, it mentions how many believe. Now, did everybody believe there in that city? No, but many did. And I believe every one of those that did, uh, that believed, got saved. But here's the thing. When it came to the multitudes, were they not very fickle? Okay? And so while people are seeing these miracles, they're all kind of for him. And many that saw the miracles believed, and those people got saved. And here for a while, you've got the crowd. While not everybody believes, they're kind of on his side. They're not mad at him. But what would usually happen after Jesus would go somewhere... They would go and then people would start stirring up the multitudes. And Jesus looked at that crowd and he knew them. He knew that heart. And he's like, you know what? They're for me right now, but I'm not going to commit myself to them. In other words, I'm not going to put myself in their hands. I'm not going, I'm not going to stay here. Okay. I'm not, go, I'm going to move on and I'm going to go somewhere else because it was not his time to die. It was not his time to go to the cross. And Jesus knew because of his knowledge that he had, him being God, he knew if he stayed there, it would be bad for him. And we see that, how sometimes he would, he'd have to kind of withdraw himself. And he'd, have to, he'd have to get away because it wasn't time for him to die. 
And he wasn't going to let the people kill him until it was his time. And so when it says he did not commit himself unto them, it means he did not put himself in their hands. He protected himself. He kept away. Not he did not. It's not saying he didn't commit himself unto those who believed, but he's referring. It's referring to those multitudes because he knew all men. They're for me now, but it's only a matter of time, and they're going to turn on me. And so he got out while the getting was good. Why was why? Because he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. This story is showing the knowledge of Jesus that he had. It's showing that God-like knowledge that he had. And so that passage is not at all teaching, you know, you got to believe in Jesus and he's got to believe in you too. Okay? That's, just, that's just goofy. You won't find that anywhere else in the Bible and you won't even find it in that passage in the Bible. It's very clear what that's teaching. So John 2, basically to sum it up, I think Jesus Christ, the miracle worker, he does, he does his first miracle there. He did that for the disciples so they would believe. They followed him. He went, into that te- he went into that temple. He's driving the people out. But notice what the people didn't do at the temple. They didn't believe him, did they? They wanted a sign. He did not give them a sign. He moves on. He goes to the next place. And many of the people there believed, but not all of them. And, he sh- and right here it's showing that God-like knowledge that he had Showing, proving who he was, he was able to see into the very hearts of man. And so he did. He didn't commit himself to them. And so, you know, John 2, I, do, I think it's just more evidence of the deity of Christ. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Jesus was a man who could do miracles only God could do. He had authority that only God had. He, and he had knowledge that only God could have. That John chapter 2, more proof that Jesus was God by those miracles, by his authority, by his knowledge. And don't, don't ever let anybody, listen, there's a lot of teaching out there trying to take away from the deity of Christ. That is dangerous, dangerous ground uh, when, you, when you start going that direction. Be careful trying to separate Jesus from God. You're going to get yourself in big trouble. Jesus was a man. God was in heaven. I can't, I don't know how to explain all that stuff, but right here, it's proof Jesus is God too. And he, he gave clear evidence of that. And so with that, let's all stand together.